Could I have your attention so we could start the program? Um, let me welcome all of you to the Institute today. Um, we thought if we'd had perfect foresight, we would have had a complete analysis of the TPP agreement. Um, but Jeff Schott, who's here, is working on that, and we'll have that soon, but we don't have it quite yet, not having been perfect in our anticipation of the outcome over the weekend. Uh, what we do have is obviously related. Um, we put it under the heading of U.S. competitiveness. Uh, it's really a discussion of some new research on the uh, international investment of U.S. and global multinational firms, um, how those are affected by a whole variety of things, including tax issues, uh, and how, in turn, the role of FDI, the role of multinationals, affects the competitiveness of the U.S. economy. Uh, we've got two presentations that will uh, attack different aspects of that. The first will be by Lindsay Oldensky, who's a non-resident but very active uh, senior fellow here at the Peterson Institute. Um, she teaches international economics at Georgetown School of Foreign Service after having taught at SICE uh, prior to that. Lindsay, as many of you know, has worked with Ted Moran over the years and is now one of the great experts on FDI and U.S. multinationals. And she's going to address this famous issue of reshoring by U.S. firms. Uh, how much is in it? Why is it happening? How far will it go? Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, talking about the implications of that for the competitiveness of the U.S. economy. Um, Gary Huffbauer uh, will then talk about the big new initiative that the OECD is taking on uh, tax, the taxation of multinational firms. As you know, probably, the OECD has this big program called BEPS, which is an effort to uh, increase global taxation of multinationals, plug loopholes, and the like, which uh, has been a big focus, actually, of G20 and other high-level discussions over the last few years. Uh, Gary's got a new paper uh, analyzing that OECD action plan, and we'll relate that to the ongoing debate about the U.S. tax treatment of corporations and multinationals in general. Uh, most of you know Gary as a great expert on trade and investment issues, which he is. What you may not know is that he's also a great expert on tax issues. Uh, in fact, having at one point in, early in his career, having been um, the director of the international tax staff at the Treasury before he became deputy assistant secretary of Treasury for trade and investment issues, working with me when I was there. So Lindsay and Gary will make the initial presentations, about 15 minutes each. Then we're delighted to have two superb discussants. Um, Jared Bernstein, uh, who is now at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, uh, and was prior to that the Chief Economist and Economic Advisor to Vice President Biden, uh, and a member of the Obama Economic Team. We're hoping that Jared will give us a few insights on whether the Vice President will or won't. Uh, we assume he has full knowledge of that and will be able to share it with us uh, if he does. Uh, <laughs> but Jared is one of the great experts on this set of issues and has been very active in the recent trade policy debate, including with me on some of the currency aspects of it. Um, batting cleanup will then be Thea Lee, who returns to our platform. She's been on it many times before. She's now Deputy Chief of Staff at the AFL-CIO, where she also serves, uh, has served as Policy Director and Chief International Economist. And as all of us in this room, I think, know, she has been the labor movement's chief spokesperson on international trade and investment issues for a considerable period of time, a uh, highly respected voice on those topics. And she, too, will then comment on the uh, presentations of Lindsay and Gary and express her own views on how U.S. policy ought to be modified vis-a-vis -vis international investment, multinational firms, and the like. So with no further ado, Gary, uh, Lindsay first, then Gary, then Jared, then Thea, and then we will open it up for discussion with all of you and field questions. Lindsay. All right, 
Great. Uh, thanks, Fred, for the introduction. And uh, my comments today are going to focus on the concept of reshoring of manufacturing activities by U.S. multinational firms. So reshoring happens when firms that have decided to offshore some aspects of their production in the past rethink those decisions and bring some or all of that production back to the U.S. So I'll start with just a few recent examples of firms doing reshoring. And reports of these have started appearing you know, roughly around 2009 with uh, one example of General Electric, Electric moving production of water heaters from China back to Kentucky. And then we've seen a number of others, just a few of them are listed here, uh, as recently as this year when Ford announced that it would be producing its new turbocharged EcoBoost engines in the U.S. at its Cleveland plant rather than in Mexico or, or any of its other facilities. So again, this is just a small number of some of the uh, many, many examples you could come up with. And so these, these anecdotes, these stories have attracted a lot of attention. Of course, the firms that are doing the reshoring themselves have been uh, very quick to send out press releases to really publicize their reshoring activities. And this has been picked up on in the public press. If you just do a Google News search of the word reshoring, it produces thousands and thousands of results on this topic. And uh, it's caught the attention as high up as President Obama, who's in a number of different speeches, has praised reshoring initiatives as something that's positive and something that's potentially a new trend in US manufacturing. So in spite of all this attention, uh, almost no one has actually looked at the data to say whether these are just a few isolated incidents or whether there's some widespread trend, right? Is reshoring enough to offset offshoring? Which, which one is larger? What's, what's going to be the net effect here? So that's what I do here. This is what I've done in my recent policy brief that my comments today are based on. And you know, just to, to to ruin the punchline here, what we're going to see is that actually this is not a huge widespread trend. That yes, we do see reshoring by firms, but it is far overshadowed by new outsourcing uh, by other firms, and in many cases, even by the same firms who are themselves announcing new reshoring initiatives. So I'll show you that data, but then I want to spend the rest of the time thinking about what the implications are. If we don't see massive reshoring, you know, is this a bad thing uh, for U.S. workers, for U.S. consumers, U.S. competitors, and competitiveness? Well, you know, not necessarily. So I'll, I'll talk about some of those implications as well. So here, this is just some data on offshoring by U.S. multinational firms. So the blue line here is imports, um, these are manufacturing imports by U.S. multinationals from the foreign affiliates that they own in other countries. So uh, this is weighted by sales. So you know, for the blue line, you can see in the last year available, 2012, it's you know, a little over six, almost 7% of the total value of sales is comprised by imports from these foreign affiliates of multinationals. So, so first of all, it's still a relatively small number, 7% of the within firm offshoring, um, but it's been growing steadily still. And the, the red line is the similar measure, but instead of imports from affiliates within the firm, these are the arm's length imports. So this is offshoring outside the firm, buying from third party suppliers in other countries. And the, these have both, um, you know, since 2009, when we first started seeing reports of reshoring, these have both continued to increase, right? So you might say, well, okay, but it looks like it might be flattening out a little bit there uh, around 2012. Um, this is the most recent data we have on the multinationals. But if you look at more recent data from the US Census, which goes through 2014 uh, and looks at all trade, not just multinationals, you can see there is uh, a continued increasing trend even since 2012. So, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be any trend. You know, we, we do see the reshoring, you know, it's real. There are firms who are making these decisions to bring back production, but it's not so large. Even six years after we've, we've started hearing all this buzz, it's not so large as to offset the increases in offshoring, which are still, still much larger in magnitude than the increases in reshoring that we've seen. So, you know, how could this be? We, we hear all these stories, we have our eight or 9,000 Google news search results on reshoring, you know, why, why doesn't this add up 
to, to any visible effect in the data? And the answer is, you know, not surprising to anyone who really understands how global commerce works, right? Value chains are very complex, especially international value chains, and it's not surprising that you know, across firms in different industries, we're going to see different sourcing strategies for firms in electronics and semiconductors, in refrigerators, in steel, and so forth. But even within the same firm, firms are using not just one monolithic strategy, but a number of different strategies for their different products and for their different stages of production. And so here's just a few examples of you know, a couple of the firms that were on that first slide that I showed you as examples of firms with highly publicized uh, reshoring activities that have also been expanding their offshoring at the same time that they've been expanding their reshoring. So, you know, GE is one of the ones I mentioned was bringing some production back to the U.S., but at the same time also building new factories in China and India. And, you know, Ford, another one of the ones making very pu highly publicized announcements um, this year, also expanded their production, their new manufacturing investments in Mexico. And again, you know, not surprising at all. What is Ford doing in the U.S.? Well, it's their cutting edge uh, EcoBoost engines. These are sort of the newest engines being produced by Ford. They're being produced, you know, in the U.S., in Cleveland, where the high-skilled workers are located, whereas, you know, a lot of what's happening in Mexico are going to be some of the more routine, lower-skilled type work. And, and this is not really surprising um, at all. Okay, so, you know, these arguments about reshoring and reshoring advocates are saying that it's not just these, these stories, right? We shouldn't think that reshoring is going to take off, you know, just because we see some examples of firms that are doing it. But also, if you look at some things going on around the globe, one of the biggest ones is increasing costs, particularly wage costs, in countries that have been major destinations for offshoring, such as China. But um, you can see when wages and other costs are increasing in China, reshoring back to the U.S. is not the only option. At the same time, we've got all these reports of reshoring. There's reports of companies shifting away from China towards other locations. So, for instance, you know, Coach, who makes uh, wallets and handbags, have been moving some of that production from China to Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines. And there's many other examples of firms that had been offshoring to China, now offshoring to Mexico and other countries. So it's not, you know, an either or, are you offshoring, are you producing domestically, um, but we see a lot of the response to these, these cost changes as shifts across countries. And, you know, you can see that as in some anecdotes, but you can see that in the data as um, offshoring from China has kind of leveled out a little bit. You can see increases from other countries, and in particular, you know, Mexico is the big one, which I had to put this on a separate graph because the numbers are so much higher, it would, you know, dwarf uh, number of the other countries here, um, steadily increasing um, offshoring to Mexico by U.S. firms, with, of course, you know, that, that dip there is obviously um, from the recession in around 2009. Okay, so offshoring doesn't seem to be slowing down. Um, we see some examples of reshoring, but not enough to, to change the net direction of these flows. So, you know, what does that mean for U.S. workers? So, I just want to review some of what we know about offshoring and the effect of offshoring on U.S. firms, U.S. workers, and U.S. competitiveness. Um, so, first of all, you know, offshoring by firms as actually strengthens U.S. manufacturing, making firms more competitive. U.S. firms are able to get a larger share of the total global market, become more competitive, and hire more not just in their foreign locations, but also in the U.S. And uh, Ted Moran and I have done a lot of research on this here for the Peterson Institute and have put out, you know, a number of publications. You can, you know, look at the, the more careful econometric data there. But the, you know, basic result is that this isn't a zero-sum game. You have complementarities between international and foreign activities. Um, but of course, you know, I want to emphasize, this isn't to say that, you know, nobody's going to lose their job here, right? Obviously, when you have these kinds of shifts, you're going to have some plants closing down. You're going to have some activities, some jobs that had been done in the U.S. that are, are not being done as much in the U.S., and a lot of times the gains are in other areas. 
right? And so, you know, this is, this is really kind of the key policy area here, right? It's not, you know, is offshoring sort of a net bad because of the, the benefits for the U.S. economy and, and actually U.S. workers um, are positive, but you do have certain groups and certain occupations and certain workers who are negatively affected. So the, the really the key policy question here is how do you harness these new opportunities, right? How do you provide safety nets? How do you provide new training so that people who had previously been employed in areas that are shrinking have the ability to take advantage of opportunities in areas that are growing, uh, because those are certainly there as well. And then, you know, finally, just to emphasize that, you know, manufacturing employment in the U.S. has been falling for decades, since at least the 1960s. And, you know, this is not primarily due to offshore. And this is not a trend that's been going on well before the current increase in international offshoring. And, you know, there are many other reasons for this, including technological change, including changes in demand. Uh, what Americans consume uh, consists much more of services and high-tech goods um, as opposed to, you know, simple manufactured goods than it did, you know, several decades ago. And so, you know, this is not, um, offshoring is not the, the only and certainly not the, the primary driver behind um, the fall or in, you know, certain areas of manufacturing employment in particular. Okay, so what does that mean for the U.S.? I mean, what are these areas that are growing? Well, good news, um, at least for, for sort of the U.S. Uh, as a whole and then the characteristics of our workforce, that um, at least one 2014 A.T. Kearney survey of production location decisions uh, of all the factors that firms were considering when deciding where to locate various stages of production, um, wages were number five tied with customer responsiveness improvement. Um, so this is good for the U.S., right, where, you know, uh, obviously we don't have the lowest wages. Competing on wages is, is not going to be um, the best area for U.S. competitiveness. Um, but things like quality improvement, total cost of ownership adjusted for productivity, you know, these, these are really important. And so if you look at uh, the last bullet point there, at what these firms are doing in the U.S., a lot of it is very high-scale, high-value added activities like research and development. So about 84% of R&D spending by U.S. multinational firms globally happens in the U.S. And that's been very stable over uh, the last decade or so. That's something that hasn't been changing and reflects you know, very strong U.S. comparative advantage in that area. And you can see, you know, this is data from the same set of, um, you know, all U.S. multinational firms that, you know, yeah, the imports have been increasing, offshoring has been increasing, but at the same time, so have exports. And this is very important, that the firms that are doing the offshoring are also doing a lot of exporting, both within the boundaries of the firms themselves and arm's length. And this, this graph is just for manufacturing, but if you take into account, you know, services, and this is, this is not just multinationals, this is just services as, as a whole, um, for the economy, um, you see that, you know, U.S. service exports haven't just been increasing, but they exceed U.S. service imports. And so, you know, again, very important. You can, it's very easy to focus on offshoring and think about flows in one direction, but it's important to keep in mind that these flows are moving in both directions, and in many times these global value chains are what is what is allowing these firms to be able to export more and expand their competitiveness. Um, okay, and then another word sort of on this, you know, while I'm talking about services and manufacturing, um, if you think about how much of the economy is actually employed in traditional manufacturing production, it's very small. It's only about 4.6% of total non-farm U.S. employment, so less than 5% of U.S. workers working, you know, not in the manufacturing sector broadly defined, but just in actual physical production jobs in manufacturing. Uh, because if you look at the data on, you know, total manufacturing sector employment, and this is, again, as a share of, of total U.S. non-farm employment, it's about 8.8 percent, right? But half of those workers aren't in what we think of as traditional manufacturing production. They're not working in factories. They're not physically making goods. They're, they're designing them. They're, they're engineers. They're mathematicians. They're managers. They're in marketing in these other jobs. And so, you know, if we focus as um, you know, not all, but as a number of the, you know, uh, 
proponents of, of reshoring and advocates for this do on, on bringing back physical plants and physical production, you know, that's really not something that the U.S. is doing a lot of or has been doing a lot of for a while. Um, and so thinking about, you know, where is manufacturing employment growing, this is within the manufacturing sector. Um, you take that sector as a whole, break it up into occupations. So you might be employed in the manufacturing sector working for Ford or GE or something, but if you're you know, an engineer or an architect or you're in finance or something like that, you know, you're not necessarily doing the physical production. And so the jobs within manufacturing that are growing, um, the fastest growing one and the one growing the most is architecture and engineering occupations it's over the last decade, followed by business and finance, managers, computer and math, and sales. And the ones that are shrinking are the physical production with, uh, and, and support occupations, with production occupations seeing the, the largest decline here. And so you can see you know, there's, there's a change in what manufacturing looks like in the US. And you can see this even more if you look outside of the narrow classification of manufacturing you know, sectors as defined by our industry classification systems. So Bernard and Fort at Dartmouth have termed these types of factories or these types of firms factory list goods producers. So, you know, think about firms that, you know, produce something that, that actually looks like a physical product, right? Apple is one of the best examples. They produce iPhones, iPads, laptop computers. These are goods. You might think of this as something that should be in the manufacturing sector, but guess what? You know, Apple doesn't actually produce almost any of this, right? It's, it's done in other countries by other firms, even though Apple themselves are, um, you know, very carefully controlling all aspects of production. If you look at the U.S. Census data and you look at the classification of the establishments that Apple owns in the U.S., almost none of them are classified as manufacturing. And so, you know, if you think about, you know, what, what does this mean for the future, um, you know, the future of manufacturing, well, you know, it's, it's already been changing, right? It's already been evolving. And a lot of those jobs at Apple for the engineers uh, working in, in management, working in marketing, working in sales, you know, these, these again, higher paying, higher skilled, generally considered to be, you know, good jobs, but, um, you know, and, you know, representing strength in the U.S. manufacturing sector, high U.S. competitiveness in what are generally considered to be manufactured goods, but in a new type of structure for manufacturing, right? It doesn't look like what it looked like uh, back in the 1940s, the 1950s, or the 1960s. You know, the U.S. manufacturing sector is changing, it's evolving, and, you know, reshoring is, um, you know, in some ways kind of a nostalgic idea that, that a lot of people are, are pointing towards, but it just doesn't really necessarily reflect what the firms are actually doing and, you know, is not necessarily going to be the best strategy for improving U.S. competitiveness, even in the manufacturing sector itself. So um, just to conclude, you know, in this increasing globalized world, even though we have more and more offshoring of production, U.S. manufacturing, you know, need not become obsolete, but it has been changing quite a bit. And, you know, this, this doesn't have to be a setback for U.S. workers, right? You know, as I said, the, the key is to look forward and to really think about the U.S. workforce and, you know, and again, not to under, um, you know, sort of, not to, uh, you know, sort of underemphasize the importance of jobs that are lost, of, you know, those production occupations, um, you know, the people who are in them who are now, you know, finding that there's just not as much demand for their skills, you know, that's very important, but that's the key right there, is thinking about, you know, those workers, what do we do in terms of safety nets, what do we do in terms of retraining, you know, how do we have a U.S. workforce that is going to be the most competitive and you know, is going to be prepared for this changing nature of um, global production moving forward rather than necessarily, you know, moving back and trying to reclaim manufacturing as it looked like um, several decades ago. Thanks. Uh, 
I want to start off by thanking my colleagues on this project, <clears throat> Eugen Jung, Tyler Moran, and Martin Piero. It was a big effort because of the BEPS uh, report, the Base Erosion and Profit Shifting Report is a very uh, lengthy report, and it took all four of us to try to digest it. Uh, this um, report done by the OECD, which was previewed on their website yesterday, um, it's extremely ambitious. They did it in pretty fast time, a couple of years up to this point. Uh, it's uh, several hundred pages, probably 800 pages or so when you take all the, the individual action items together. Uh, as in trade, any big change in tax law has winners and losers. So what about this, uh, these suggestions that are put forward by the OECD? If implemented, that's a big if. Uh, <laughs> there's one clear group of winners, and that's uh, tax lawyers and accountants. In fact, it's so clear I'm tempted to refresh my legal skills and take on a second job. Um, it might be good for some foreign treasuries. Um, in fact, they're already taking advantage of some of, the recommend, some of the recommendations. I think it will be clearly bad, and that's the uh, burden of the uh, report that we're summarizing here <clears throat> now, for uh, U.S. competitiveness and U.S. multinational companies. Um, at this juncture, I think it would also be bad for the global economy, if implemented, big if, uh, because what we need in the global economy is a lot more investment, not a lot less. Now, um, some might point to the huge cash balances that are sitting, or they're not even cash balances, it's assets, it's earnings and profits, much of which has been reinvested in various forms abroad. But the number for U.S., multinationals is about $2.1 trillion. And some people point to this number as kind of a big pot of cash, which it's not, which is certainly ripe for the, for the picking. Um, you know, you could combine the BEPS recommendations with a huge investment tax credit and other incentives. And then you might say, well, it's kind of balanced in terms of the needs of the economy, the U.S. economy, and others at this time. There is no such combination in this, in this report. Um, now, our policy brief, which is out there, uh, has about 40 pages, and the OECD, fortunately, yesterday, released an executive summary of the so-called 15 actions which make up the BEPS project and it's about 40 pages. So unless you're an attorney or an accountant, I suggest you read the executive summary if you want their view on it. Okay, I've gone through some of this background. The, uh, the project was inspired by widespread criticism of avoidance of taxes by multinational corporations. And it's very important, I mean, if you're in the tax world, there's a big distinction between avoidance and evasion. Evasion is breaking the law. These companies, for the most part, I won't say 100%, but for a very large portion, they respect all the laws in every country where they do business, all the tax laws. So we're not talking about evasion here. We're talking about avoidance. And avoidance is in the eye of the beholder. So... You know, you're the beholder and you're somewhat antagonistic towards what Apple might be doing or Starbucks or Google or whatever, and you'll call it a loophole. The Obama administration has largely supported, largely, but not entirely supported the BEPS project. And the deeper we got in, the more the administration, meaning really the Treasury, has developed some qualms. Uh, but Equally important, key congressmen, by which I mean Senator Hatch and Senator Schumer, Democrat, and Congressman Ryan, and some Democrats on the House side, they are quite skeptical. 
Now, because of interactions between the U.S. existing tax system and the BEPS recommendations, that combination, I, I can get only one point across, it's the combination of our existing tax system, which I believe is the worst in the world as far as uh, com competing countries go, um, <clears throat> and layered on top the possible BEPS recommendation, which makes U.S. multinational corporations the main target. As mentioned, some countries are already implementing some parts of the BEPS recommendations. It's 15 actions, a lot of individual points in there to attack U.S. multinational. Now, just think about it if you're a finance minister and you need to raise money. I mean, what is the least, what is the target which can least defend itself? First, it's a multinational, and second, it's a foreign multinational. So that means an American multinational. So American multinationals have already, already, thanks to this project, faced higher taxes in such countries as Australia, uh, the U.K., and France, and others. Now, there are some unspoken assumptions in underlying the report. I want to bring them out because I think they clearly differentiate our views from those who are keen about this project. Firstly, that the corporate tax is a good tax. There's a long literature on this. We don't have time to go through it. You either think it's a great tax, something akin to the biblical tithe, or you think it's the, the worst kind of conceivable tax invention that's come along, and that's my view. Secondly, that, that implementing these recommendations or raising corporate taxes in general would have a small impact on production, but it would be very beneficial for equity. That's a second unspoken assumption. And flowing from those, I guess, is that the corporate tax should be defended from international tax competition. Part of globalization, a big part of it, is international tax competition, just as we have tax competition between our states. I mean, there's a huge difference between Connecticut and North Carolina, just to take one example. Well, <clears throat> we disagree with all these assumptions, unspoken assumptions, but they're critical. They propelled the whole report and the whole steam behind it. But Equally important, unlike the United States, most countries, and we have data in the tables, are phasing down the corporate tax. They've been phasing it down for 30 years. We are not phasing it down yet, though there's a lot of talk about phasing it down. But as they phase it down, it makes our MNCs, based in the United States, less competitive. Now. So before getting into the weeds on the, on the BEPS, uh, our recommendations are that the United States should cut the corporate tax rate from 35% to 25% or lower. Uh, candidate Trump said 15%. Others have said 20%. Uh, we should embrace the global norm of territorial taxation which broadly speaking, I could go into the details but won't, uh, broadly speaking means you tax income earned at home and you don't tax income earned by your subsidiaries located abroad. And that is now the global norm to which the U.S. is the outstanding exception. And we should probably uh, adopt the same kind of patent box system which other countries, especially in Europe, have adopted, which means the intellectual property income all this R&D we do goes into a separate kind of box. It's a, it's a tax concept, a tax box, and gets taxed at a lower rate. Now, <clears throat> that's, that's our recommendation. But just to be clear on the equity point, because I know this is uh, deeply embedded in, in, in the minds in the American public and elsewhere, uh, I am in favor, and I think my colleagues are in favor, of dealing with equity in one way and one way only, and that's the personal income tax. And even Trump recommended raising the personal income tax on the rich, some of whom may be in this room, so they may 
find that an uncomfortable suggestion. But nevertheless, if you want to deal with equity, that's how you deal with it. Now, we divide the BEPS actions, these 15 actions, into several categories. And the ones I'll talk about briefly are the troublesome suggestions, uh, the harmless and even useful suggestions. They are there for reasons of time. I won't talk about them. Okay. Even before going to that, I want to... I think pretty strongly criticized the BEPS report for what I regard as insufficient quantitative evaluation. I mean, the OECD is an enormous place in terms of personnel, and it is very well known for good quantitative analysis on lots of subjects. This report, and the quantitative part is all in Action 11, is has one point which, as I say, surprise, surprise, because it's you know, like uh, Casablanca, it's no surprise at all, that MNCs locate their income in low-tax jurisdictions. I mean, there have been a 100 studies to this effect. We've known it for 20 years or longer. I, I was in the Treasury in the 70s, and we knew it then, so I guess the secret slipped out. Uh, <laughs> so they review all these studies, and then they add one of their own. But what they don't do and what they should have done was tell us what the proposed changes would do. And I just pick out a couple of things which are quite important. Which countries would gain tax revenue on a static assumption and which would lose? I think the U.S. would be a big loser. We don't have any of that. What we have is kind of a general number that there might be 100 billion, maybe 200 billion more taxes collected a year, but we don't know where, what industries, what countries, and so forth. Nor, and this is really important, do they say anything about the link between taxation and investment. Investment both in physical capital, but as Lindsay's uh, report so emphasized, intellectual capital. I mean, that's the U.S. big strength. And the fact that a company like Apple has, on some measures, low taxes, though we have an appendix on Apple, not when you take all the stakeholders, it doesn't, it doesn't have particularly low taxes, but on some measures it does, and that's, an, that's rewarding the intellectual capital that it has, and you could name any other co companies in that basket. Now, finally, coming to the troublesome suggestions. Action one. This one is what has given the Treasury pause. There's the concept which really dates, you know, before probably anybody in this room was born. It dates back, I think, to the 20s, um, of a permanent establishment. And that's a certain physical presence before your company is subject to taxation in the other country where you're doing business, export sales. Certain physical limitations, physical characteristics. This is built into all tax treaties. The permanent establishment concept, it was codified in the OECD, but I think it precedes the OECD efforts back in the 30s and so forth. Well, what this report suggests is to revisit the permanent establishment concept. And what does that revisiting mean? What it really means, the big revisiting, is to tax, to tax digital exports. Guess who does digital exports? Which country does that? Well, this is totally against U.S. interests. And if we're going to tax digital, if we're going to tax, now remember, we're talk, talking about the business profits, not retail sales tax, not value added tax, business profits tax on digital exports. Well, all the big U.S. companies would be hard hit. Um, and, you know, if you're going to do that, why not tax the business profits earned on merchandise, you know, imports? I should have said digital imports, that would be the taxing jurisdiction. Why not tax digital merchandise imports? And you go down that path, and what you're really talking about is a new kind of tariff barrier, except it's much more opaque than tariffs we know and love, which are on 8,000 you know, tariff line categories. Um, this would be a profits tax. So suddenly, companies would be subject to profits tax in a lot of countries. And this is already happening. Some countries are already beginning to move the line on where you can tax business profits. 
Um, and I think going, looking to the future, you, you put this in, then a small company, which is in the digital business, will suddenly find itself hassled as well as paying taxes to a lot of jurisdictions that are just exporting digital stuff. So that's pretty troublesome. Next. Next, what the, uh, what the action report, action three is where it's concentrated, action three and four. What they want is for parent companies to tax CFC, that stands for Controlled Foreign Corporations, that's the subsidiaries. They want parent companies to tax the controlled foreign corporation income, that's the royalties for the most part, but also interest, uh, that's action four, <coughs> in part. Um, they want them to tax the parent countries to, uh, to ta the, co the headquarters companies for MNCs to tax the parent company uh, passive income at parent company rates. Now, the U.S. system, as bad as it is, the breathing room it has, the tax system, is that U.S. parent companies are able to locate a lot of this passive income in countries which I like to call low-tax countries, others like to call tax havens, you know, to put in a little pejorative uh, language there. And, oh, that's a big loophole. Well, what I would say, if that loophole did not exist, or that possibility did not exist, and you actually impose the 35% rate, that is the U.S. statutory rate, on all this passive income, you wouldn't have had just a handful of inversions you would have had a wave of inversions. And, you know, companies would have gone abroad if we stuck with this rate, which is so much higher than other countries do. You don't have to go very far. You can go to Toronto. I was just in Toronto on Sunday and Monday, yesterday. I mean, you know, it's a wonderful city, beautiful lake, et cetera, et cetera, and speaks English, you know, good laws, good courts. You know, you just move. And... So I say the fact that we have a system which allows U.S. companies to establish CFCs in foreign countries to have interest income and world income and so forth is, is, has been the breathing and the saving grace from our otherwise wretched corporate tax system for multinationals. The interest deduction is the same issue, but it has, it's on the deduction side. I won't spend more time unless there are questions. Okay, the next one, which I find troublesome, which we find troublesome, is this notion of prevent treaty abuse. Well, language matters. I mean, at least, I guess most lawyers learn that and most economists kind of grasp it. Language matters. As soon as you call something abuse or a loophole, you know, you've, you've prejudged the outcome. But what I would ask this group to do is think about rules of origin in trade. Now, most economists think that rules of origin in trade are basically the work of protectionism, if not the work of the devil. Yes, we have them, but we don't have them for the legitimate reason, which is trade deflection. We have them for reasons of protection. Now, what this prevention of treaty abuse is all about is establishing rules of origin for treaty use. This actually gives the Treasury also some indigestion because the test is not like rules of origin in goods where, you know, you can, if you have the human resources or the computer resource, you can read what the, you know, the, the requirements are for rules of origin in goods. These rules of origin and treaty abuse are two tests, limitation of benefits and principal purpose test, which are entirely subjective and would be applied by countries according to the OECD recommendations. This would mean that U.S. multinationals would be in doubt whether when they uh, use, avail themselves of a uh, tax treaty, let's say between Italy and Brazil, if there is such a treaty, that they could use that. Because maybe that's going outside the rules of origin. Maybe that goes into the category of what's called 
treaty abuse. So that's troublesome. I've already talked about PE status. I won't go on that anymore. The uh, transfer pricing guidelines. Well, the OECD codified way back when we were all much younger, the notion of the arm's length principle. And this is reinforced in the BEPS. That's the principle for taxing transactions between related companies. The, the new BEPS, however, has, it suggests some special measures with respect to intangible uh, assets risk and overcapitalization, which are, go into quite some details. <clears throat> but if adopted, if these recommendations were adopted, a lot more US MNCs would invert because they would find that their transfer prices were inadequate for one tax authority or another. So let me quickly go to the conclusions um, which I will pass over that one, I'll pass over that one and go to the conclusions. Our corporate tax system already encourages firms to invert. Um, they discourage innovation and investment. Now we have a lot of good things going in this economy, so on balance, we get a lot of innovation and we get investment, not as much as we need, but we get quite a bit. If we layered BEPs on top of these uh, existing bad practices, it would uh, compound the bad side of the incentives. So our first and strongest recommendation is that Congress should align U.S. corporate taxation with global norms and, uh, as I said at the beginning, higher household taxes on which households are the way and the only way to address equity. Thanks very much. This was entirely done in-house. Thank you. Um, I have a presentation too. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Uh, um, well, thanks so much for inviting me. And uh, thank you so much, Gary and team, for reading through all that BEP stuff for us. Uh, definitely a bit of a slog. Uh, and. Uh, I appreciate uh, uh, the Institute inviting myself and Thea uh, here, as our views um, will probably uh, sound somewhat different from what you've heard so far. Uh, by the way, two uh, factual uh, points before I begin on comments Gary made. One was that uh, uh, he thinks that under the BEPS, the tax lawyers will be winners. I suspect the tax lawyers will be winners no matter what happens. Uh, Secondly, uh, by the way, th this is interesting. I actually looked at the distributional impact of the Trump tax cut, and he hugely cuts taxes for rich people. Uh, in fact, 34% of uh, Trump's tax cuts uh, go to the top 1%, 9% go to the middle class. So I just want to, you know, that's not, n not at all core to your presentation, but I just want to get that on the record. Um, so I wanted to talk uh, actually more about uh, the BEPS paper than um, Lindsay's, although I, I, I want to say a few words ab about that as well, only because I, I found the BEPS paper um, uh, uh, just had a, a lot more moving parts, and, and, and Lindsay's I thought was uh, you know, pretty straightforward, and I think I can give you my comments pretty quickly on that. Uh, uh, and, and I have a feeling it may be, uh, Thea may be more balanced in her comments. So let me jump right in. Um, so Gary and the team, BEPS mostly stinks. There are a couple of points there that weren't, uh, uh, that, that a couple of the action plans they thought weren't so bad. Um, and, and I, I uh, uh, come at it from a, a pretty different place. Um, summarizing what uh, I took to be the points from 30,000 feet, um, when it comes to tax avoidance, if you can't beat them, uh, join them. This is kind of the idea that we have uh, uh, a corporate code that's so riddled with incentives to uh, avoidance, if we try to um, do more to, if, if we try to close off those avenues of, of avoidance and collect the revenues that uh, uh, we believe we're owed in our tax system, we're going to do more harm to good and stifle growth and innovation. 
Uh, but that assumes that the BEPs won't work. And I think this is a key disagreement. Um, I don't see anything uh, in the paper, uh, although I thought your criticism, by the way, was, was very on point about the lack of quantitative uh, analysis from the OECD on these points. But I certainly didn't see anything in the Huffbauer et al. paper that led me to believe that the uh, uh, believe uh, that, that led me to conclude that the belief that the BEPs will have the negative impacts that they think is anything more than an assertion. I could just as easily assert that the, the BEPs uh, will uh, effectively uh, collect more revenue without stifling innovation. So I, I think we're dangerously in the land of assertion here. Uh, from a U.S. perspective, concern, this is again, this is Huffbauer et al., uh, from our perspective, concern should transcend tax rules in favor of the prosperities of U.S. firms, growth, jobs, R&D. Um, but surely collecting tax revenues and growth and innovation are not exclusive. Uh, in this sense, uh, there's kind of a missing counterfactual. Uh, what would happen to growth, jobs, R&D, budget deficits, uh, the ability to do some of the things that Lindsay was asking for, by the way, including retraining and, uh, and uh, uh, offsetting some of the negative impacts of offshoring if, in fact, uh, we punt on uh, the revenues that we're losing through tax avoidance of MNCs. Uh, so, uh, third, uh, BEP seeks to move the legal goalposts, and that may inflict significant damage on U.S. economic interests. It's not obvious that paying taxes kills innovation. Uh, in fact, one could make an argument, and I'd be tempted to do so, that tax avoidance kills innovation. And the fact that um, uh, General Electric has about 1,000 tax lawyers on staff strikes me as not a, a very optimal idea. The fact that Apple has to go through all kinds of uh, machinations to create double Dutch Irish sandwiches strikes me as not what Apple ought to be good at. So uh, again, I, I felt the paper was much too assertive in just assuming that somehow um, complying with uh, tax codes kills innovation. Um, the problem, base erosion and profit shifting, uh, uh, the fact of transfer pricing, these are all problems, just uh, summarizing what uh, Gary and the team found. The loss of revenue is a serious problem to which the paper doesn't, uh, uh, I think, go deeply into quite enough. Uh, and then the paper acknowledges that um, uh, something you have to balance here are the equity issues that Gary raised. And the solutions, uh, to some extent, are get rid of the corporate income tax, and then I'm not sure what else happens, and somehow you achieve revenue neutrality. So I'm confused about step two, and I'll ask a bit more about that as we go on. I think Gary makes a great point that there's a, really a lack of quantitative analysis of the magnitude of the problem uh, from lots of places here. And uh, you know, Jane Gravel argues that 25% uh, uh, of corporate tax revenues, uh, uh, six tenths of a percent of GDP are squandered through BEPS, uh, uh, the kinds of, uh, of avoidance uh, schemes that BEPS is trying to solve. Um, the IMF on the left has an estimate with a very wide confidence range, that's that uh, 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 line there um, on, on the cost of um, tax avoidance uh, among multinationals in the OECD and non-OECD countries, and they're, they're not trivial. Uh, my colleague Chai Ching Huang has shown that 43% uh, of U.S. multinational foreign profits uh, are booked abroad, and yet um, the foreign workforce in those MNCs is, is tiny relative to their profits, so that looks to us like uh, profits being booked versus you know, more, more of a tax avoidance scheme. So I do think the magnitude of the problem is underexplored, as, as Gary suggests. The idea that you would get rid of the corporate tax, though, is a really bad idea. Uh, that, that, Gary didn't say much about that, that but that is a, a featured recommendation of the paper. Now, who knew? I have my own uh, bit of sarcasm here. Uh, it turns out that the income that's tax privilege is the income you've got gobs of. I'm afraid if we get rid of the corporate tax, we create a brand new tax shelter where uh, all kinds of income uh, becomes, a, a, a sched, uh, be, becomes a, a, a corporate uh, C-corp income. Um, uh, and, and then you, you're left with tax avoidance on, on steroids. Uh, what I believe Gary is uh, suggesting, or at least what's implicit in the, in the paper suggestion, is that um, instead, uh, those who, uh, uh, what, what, we, what we now have is uh, flows of corporate income through, through the tax system become uh, uh, income on the personal side of the income tax. And in fact, we've been doing a, a ton of that. If you look at this graph on the left, it shows the extent to which uh, shares of business income have shifted from C-corps to, uh, uh, to pass-throughs. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, it used to be 75% with C-corp, 25% for pass-through. Now it's about 50-50. 
And uh, if you look at the tax gap literature, which shows where in the sectoral um, uh, parts of the, uh, of the business sector do you find the most tax avoidance, it's far and away in the pass-through sector. Uh, the uh, bus uh, the, the uh, uh, business income tax at the individual level is the largest single source of the gap. Sole proprietors report less than half of their income to the IRS. So if you tried to get rid of the corporate income and moved it all to the, uh, to the individual side, you're creating a, a, a massive tax sh shift, and one that's regressive on the equity side. This would do you a great deal of harm on the equity side. The graph on the right shows the incidence of corporate tax uh, uh, falls mostly on capital, not on labor. And this is uh, CBO, Tax Policy Center, and the Treasury. That's the, these are the ways that they divide the incidence of corporate tax. And generally, it's 75% incidence on the corporate sector, 25 on labor. I mean, on corporate income, 25 on labor income. And that means if you get rid of a, of a tax that's disproportionately on uh, capital, not labor, uh, you're, you're going to mechanically increase uh, inequality. So I think it would be both tax avoidance and inequitable. Maybe not as bad as Trump, but, uh, but bad. Um, I'm going quickly here, because I am actually supposed to have, have 10 minutes. Um, and uh, I won't spend much time on this, but I do think that uh, uh, the, uh, the paper does a really interesting thing here. And I, I, don't, I, I didn't really agree with the calculations, but I thought it's worth doing. And in fact, I might uh, try to engage Gary and his co-authors to see where we uh, view this differently. I, I talked to Ed Kleinbart about this, who's really, I think, pretty, uh, you know, very insightful international tax lawyer. Um, and he was pointing out some of the, some of the issues here. Um, a lot of the, uh, uh, in, in the paper, there, there's a, a calculation that suggests uh, Apple, quote, stakeholders, and Gary et al. can explain what that are, pay 40% of their taxes on global profits already. Uh, but you can read through the, the points there. Uh, probably the main one is that the numbers that Apple provides are provision, not actual taxes paid. They tell you what they're putting aside, but they don't actually tell you what they've paid. And uh, it happens that just yesterday, I think, the CTJ put out a piece uh, that showed uh, the U.S. effective rate is prob uh, that, that, that Apple pays uh, is, uh, is probably in the mid-20s, but their tax avoidance on overseas earnings, uh, they're paying 2% on 181 billion of, uh, of, of foreign earnings, so making them a fine candidate. And just kind of concluding this part of my presentation, the question is, would BEPS actions hurt Apple innovation? And uh, the paper assumes that it would, uh, why not assume they could spend more time innovating, innovating and less time uh, avoiding taxes? And, and I think that's a very key distinction. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, I, I don't think you should approach this BEPS debate with the assumption um, uh, uh, tax is bad, BEPS bad, uh, and, uh, uh, and tax avoidance kind of a necessary shelter from the lousy U.S. code, uh, which is lousy. Um, uh, no question, the corporate code is a mess. Gary and I agree on that. Uh, but, uh, and, and to be fair, I don't have evidence that BEPS wouldn't hurt growth. I mean, neither of us are, are bringing much more than assertions to that point. Um, the paper has a lack of attention, though, to the problems they'd create by getting rid of the corporate code, as I went through before. And I think a much better idea would be to work on corporate tax reform together, which we, we really should be doing, uh, because Gary's right about its non-competitiveness, and track the um, uh, impact of the BEPS as it, as it, as it moves forward. Okay, switching to Lindsay's paper. Um, I don't have a, a lot to say about this because I thought it was a very straightforward paper. Um, uh, I just have a couple of interpretive uh, differences and, and two questions. Um, the two questions just for Lindsay to explore and she's done uh, uh, deep work in this area is um, it, it, would we learn anything more from looking at the MNC's domestic exports? So the, the paper, there was one little bit where you looked at service exports. Um, uh, but uh, the paper doesn't, uh, I think, um, uh, spend enough time helping us understand um, the extent to which um, uh, domestic, uh, the domestic entities of, uh, of MNCs are, um, are exporting in, in the face of the kinds of developments that Lindsay documents. Uh, the imports are example of offshoring, as she suggested, but the exports on the other side would be an example of uh, creating jobs here. Um, and I'd like to see more of that. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that, there's, that there wouldn't be much there, but I certainly would like to see it. 
I do think that the, it, it's helpful to think about a model in this sense, and, and the paper sort of alluded to this, but didn't um, organize it the way I might have uh, uh, liked to see, and Lindsay and other papers, I think, have gotten closer to this. But the idea is that offshoring is some sort of a function of a, of, of a number of variables, including demand proximity, costs, and labor quality. Now, demand proximity means the stuff that she was showing when she showed you the Kearney results from that survey, the idea that producers uh, these days seem to want to produce more closely to where they want to sell. So uh, um, it, it just seems to me that organizing things in those, in those terms uh, might uh, help provide a, a bit more insight. But um, uh, th those are just things you might want to explore. On three points that I thought were missing from the paper, one is that um, we have a fundamental factual disagreement here. And it may be that you're talking in shares and not numbers. But when you say that um, manufacturing employment has been falling for decades since at least the 1960s, so that's actually not the case in terms of numbers. In terms of numbers, manufacturing employment was weirdly stable by, at about 17 million from the mid-70s to 2000. And then in 2000, it just started tanking like crazy. Now, if something is steady, of course, and there's a number as a share of employment, it's declining. Uh, but I do think that that was uh, uh, both instructive in terms of uh, how stable manufacturing employment was and how much it fell since uh, 2000. And um, I think uh, scholarly work done in, in, in various venues, perhaps some here as well, has shown that uh, China's been a big player in that, that China's accession to the WTO in 2000 uh, was uh, a, a, an important factor uh, there. And let me jump into my third bullet. Um, boy, and, and here I really invoke some of my friends at, uh, at, at, uh, at, at the Institute here, which is if you're concerned about manufacturing employment, the idea that the exchange rate shows up nowhere in this paper strikes me as odd. Um, and uh, 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 as Clyde is my witness, this is something that uh, I and others obsess about, uh, perhaps too much. Uh, but certainly in the case of uh, manufacturing employment, certainly in the case of the China problem that, that I discussed, even um, issues around the TPP uh, invoke concerns about uh, the exchange rate, the strength of the dollar, currency manipulation. And I, I think that while offshoring and the trends that you're documenting are, 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 are key, uh, it's also the case that the, uh, uh, I, I think that's a much more dominant factor when it comes to manufacturing jobs. My last slide is just something I put together uh, this morning for the paper. Um, there is implicit, something I don't understand, and someone as smart as Lindsay can help me figure this out. There is implicit in the paper and in the presentation the idea that somehow manufacturing productivity is, uh, is accelerating. Um, Lindsay talked about a manufacturing sector that's employing less people but pr pr producing more output uh, and doing so in no small part because of advanced technological adaptation. Well, um, what you have here is on the left, labor productivity in manufacturing, and on the right, multi-factor productivity in manufacturing. Uh, these are jumpy numbers. They're year annual changes. I drew an HP filter line through them. I don't want to draw too much conclusion from something I did this morning in, in, you know, in 45 minutes. Uh, but it is widely agreed upon that, if anything, productivity in the U.S. is decelerating, not accelerating. And I think that's, um, if not contradicting one of the points in the paper, uh, something I'd like uh, Lindsay et al. to dig more deeply into. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. I'll be quick oh, and provocative. So uh, thanks, uh, Fred and Adam, for inviting me here today. It's always a pleasure to come back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. So the two papers, I'm going to start with Lindsay's paper, because that's where sh the presentation started. And you know, I think certainly the bulk of the paper is reshoring happening. Is it a major phenomenon? I would completely agree with Lindsay, maybe for different reasons and draw different conclusions, that the anecdotes that were told and got a lot of attention and everybody got very excited about the idea that American companies that had outsourced had changed their mind and were bringing stuff back to the United States was a little overblown. And I'm, you know, we look at the manufacturing job numbers every week and every month and try to sort of figure out what, what the trends are. And we never saw the, the fabulous trend, as, as Lindsay pointed out. You know, we're barely, we aren't back at the pre-recession level of manufacturing employment. So whatever's going on, it's not at a scale that is really having a big impact. But the second part, what does it all mean, is where I think I might diverge from Lindsay's analysis. 
And I would sum up her answer is, don't worry, it's fine. Offshoring is good for everyone. It's great for the economy. It's great for employment. And if you want to take the conclusion, and this is where I think there's going to be some connections between the two papers, the US is perfectly competitive in a global economy. And we can keep doing what we've been doing. We need to look forward, not look back. I agree we need to look forward. I don't, I'm not trying to recreate the manufacturing prowess of the 1950s in the United States, but I think there is somewhere in between everything's fabulous because if you look at a couple of markers, whether it's the trade deficit and something like advanced technology products or manufacturing, or you look at um, the failure of the United States to invest adequately in infrastructure and skills and education and research and development, uh, you look at the tax structure, and that goes to Gary's paper, and, um, and income inequality, and particularly, you know, what happens to the income of non-college educated workers who are still, you know, almost two-thirds of the U.S. labor force. And if you take all those pieces together, and I think also if you take yourself on a field trip to the Mideast or to the, South e the, the Midwest or the Southeast of the United States, and you see a lot of really devastated communities and all the ramifications that have come, it's hard to be so sanguine. And certainly for me, representing American workers at the AFL-CIO, uh, we don't see it. There was another piece of the reshoring discussion that was interesting that um, I know Harry Moser, who Lindsay mentions a couple of times, had raised, which is, are multinational corporations really making good decisions? And what are they basing those decisions on when they decide to move offshore? And that was actually something we were pretty interested in, and we worked with Harry on a little bit. Uh, she mentioned total cost um, estimates and so on. And you know, one of the senses that we had was there sometimes, there, certainly there was a period where there was such rapid offshoring going on in the early 2000s where a lot of companies told us that they didn't really want to move offshore, but they felt like they had no choices. And whether it was the financial incentives, that there was sort of a, an assumption on Wall Street that if you were a manufacturer and you were producing in the United States, you were kind of a moron. Like, why would anyone do that when you could be in the global economy producing in China or Mexico or anywhere else? And that seemed to us unfortunate, that there was sort of a, a bias built into the financial um, incentives about that. But then we also, as Fred knows and as Gary knows, look at all the different pieces of the U.S. economy to see, you know, are there uh, perverse incentives built into our tax code or to our trade agreements um, or our failure to invest that are increasing offshoring in a way that isn't good in the end of the day for American workers, not even necessarily good for domestic manufacturers. And so I guess um, and one piece of that is the connection between production and innovation. I think Lindsay glossed over this a little bit that everything's great. You know, there's more innovation than ever. It's stable and so on and so forth. But Certainly what we hear, and we hear it sometimes from engineers, we hear it from manufacturers, is that there is a link, and it's a pretty organic link between manufacturing and innovation. And if you just assume that you can move all the physical manufacturing out of the United States, uh, that at some point the, the engineers and the innovation and the technology begins to follow the physical manufacturing because there is that connection between those things, and that's something that I don't think should be downplayed. And I'm going to be quick because um, I know we're, we're behind time, so maybe some of this will come out in the, the discussion. But um, so maybe I'm just going to shift over to Gary's paper about the OECD, the BEPS process, and corporate taxes. And Gary takes on, Gary and his co authors take on an issue which is complex as a theoretical and empirical question. So it's bad enough, you know, what is the best way to, to raise tax revenues? But it's nightmarish as a political problem. And I think those are the, the two pieces of it. Something certainly we th think about all the time is what are, the, um, what, what are the incentives in a global economy? I guess here's the question. How do you align your national corporate tax system with the reality of the global economy? So that's a real question. It's a good question. There's no simple answer to it. But, um, it's also true that the, I, I don't think Gary gives enough weight to the idea that there really is a prisoner's dilemma here, which is that any one individual country may see a benefit in slashing its corporate tax rate to lure uh, companies there, if not production and jobs. 
And Gary certainly talks about how most countries are phasing down their corporate statutory tax rates, and I think Jared mentioned this, of course. The fact that this happens, that, that whether it's legal or illegal, and most of it I would agree is legal because of the 1,000 tax lawyers at GE and similar number in other places, doesn't mean it's good. Uh, that, and the only way of really addressing this is going to be through some sort of international coordination uh, ideally with some binding principles. And so the OECD seems to me the right place to address some of these concerns. It's the rich country area that has some of the economic resources, but also the membership to do that. And I think the other issue that they raise, the rise of the digital economy, does necessitate a new approach. I don't think it's enough just to say some of these things aren't good for U.S. companies. I think we need to think a little bit more deeply and creatively about um, how we're going to manage this. And, you know, some of the same issues with personal income tax are raised with corporate tax, which is that, you know, if we raised our personal income tax to a high rate, what's to keep rich people from staying in the United States and paying those taxes? If we don't have some way of addressing the international coordination here. So we clearly need a better, play, a better way of doing this, and I think just saying corporate tax, taxes are stupid and we should have fewer of them isn't really a good answer to that. Um, and, and then one other piece that comes up, I think, a lot of times in Gary's paper is, you know, he talks about the U.S. interest and how a lot of the BEPS suggestions are actually going to hurt American companies or hurt U.S. economic interests, I think is the, fir the term he uses. But I, I do think it's important that we don't equate dollar for dollar U.S. interests with U.S. multinational corporate profit. It's just, you know, and it's not enough to cite one paper that says when U.S. multinationals do well, everybody does well, because we're not feeling it. And I don't think the uh, national statistics on income inequality and the, the loss of good jobs in not just the manufacturing sector uh, really should, should leave us to be so confident that everything that's happening right now and everything that multinational corporations decide to do around offshoring and tax evasion is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. So let me conclude, I know that's going to make Fred happy, with um, two issues that, from our point of view, from the point of view of American workers, U.S. competitiveness concerns are real. That our global economic policies, whether it's our trade and investment agreements or our tax code or our failure to invest in infrastructure, are really harming the American middle class. And I think you're going to see this in the presidential campaign in the next year. And it's true for American workers, and I think it's true for domestic producers as well. A lot of those are small and medium-sized enterprises. But I mean, I think to Lindsay's question, why not bring the jobs back to the United States? What are the disincentives? Um, and I don't agree, as I said, that it's wonderful that we offshore all the production and we keep the retail jobs and the, the engineers' jobs here. I think when we run a half a trillion dollar trade deficit, uh, it's somewhat offset, you know, the manufacturing deficit is somewhat offset by the services surplus, but not entirely. And that's something that it really needs to be uh, given more attention and more e emphasis. Um, so the fact that reshoring is not happening at scale Lindsay's basic point, and that offshoring is continuing to grow, has real consequences for all these things, and I think we need to give it more attention. The global tax system and the U.S. tax system are a train wreck. So I agree on the second part with, with Gary, but I don't think that the answer is just to give in to the global competitiveness pressure in a, in a way that will harm U.S. revenues. If we harm U.S. revenues without figuring out where else to raise revenues in a way that doesn't also hurt us in the global economy, then we're not going to be able to do the things that we really need for U.S. competitiveness, which is pretty significant investments in infrastructure, in skills, in education, and in R&D. So thank you. And with that, there's going to be plenty to talk about. Well, as Thea says, there's plenty to talk about. But unfortunately, we've already reached our witching hour. So with apologies to the group, uh, I will have to call the session to a halt. Um, we tried to present the various sides of these issues, and I hope we did that successfully. Everybody did agree on one thing, that the US corporate tax code is lousy and needs fixing. And so next time around, 
maybe we'll have a session that will lay out specific proposals to do that. Gary's done it. I know Dara's done it. I know the AFL-CIO's done it. Uh, and that's a topic that we've turned to in the past. We'll need to turn to it again in the future because at the heart of all these issues discussed today lies that very fundamental problem. Thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks particularly to Lindsay, Gary, Jared, and Thea for leading us off. I wish we had more time. Next time we'll make sure to do it and we'll be able to go into this in more detail. Thank you all. Meeting adjourned.